Many of you know by now that I'm a huge fan of weird cask finishes in whiskey. So here are three of my favorites right now. Welcome back Dram Fam to the Whiskey Diary. Just before we get into things, some good news. We hit 1,000 subscribers. Thank you to everyone that watches, likes, comments, and subscribes. It really does mean the world to me that we hit 1,000 subscribers. So to celebrate, I'm gonna be doing a live stream. I haven't quite decided on the exact date. I'm actually over in Sweden in a couple of weeks, so we're gonna to have to fit it around that. Fundamentally, you guys are gonna to get to choose what I drink. Gonna write up some software that's gonna to to essentially spin the wheel and randomly select from one of the 200 whiskeys I've got behind me. And depending on how things go, we might make it a semi-regular thing, but let's see how it goes more info to come on that soon but anyway back to today's topic so what exactly is a weird cask finish well uh, i am going to be speaking pretty generally about scotch whiskey in this episode obviously that is the whiskey that i am most drawn to it is my preference of whiskey while this may differ for other whiskies i am talking about scotch whiskey the majority of scotch whiskey is aged and finished in bourbon casks. Uh, with regards to cask finishing, you have your aging period, which a, a 10 year old whiskey for instance, may spend nine years in one cask and then a year in the other. We would say it's nine years matured in one cask and one year finished in another. So that's what we mean when we say matured and finished. But the majority of Scotch whiskey is aged and matured in bourbon casks. That is because in the bourbon industry, a cask can only be used once. All bourbon must be aged in a virgin oak cask, which means it is manufactured and nothing else goes in it other than bourbon, and then that cask is useless to the bourbon industry. Well, it's more than welcome in the Scotch whiskey industry, so we tend to buy them, import them, and then fill them up with scotch. It's pretty much just supply and demand. We've been doing it for so long now, it produces a very predictable result. There are variations in different bourbon casks and different distilleries from where those casks are sourced, but for the most part, a bourbon cask is gonna produce a very predictable flavor. So that kind of begs the question, then why would we use anything else to finish a whiskey? Well, if we think of making whiskey as an art form, the different cask finishes are the colors that you may use to paint your picture. You can get such a broad variety of flavors by putting that whiskey into another cask. For In some cases, only a couple of months can have huge influences on the flavor, the color, and the aroma of that whiskey. It's not so much changing, you know, the, the, the core of that whiskey. It's just slightly augmenting the flavor, which gives blenders and distillers the opportunity to experiment. And you know I love the experimental side of whiskey. Now it's probably worth noting that not all whiskies work in all casks. I would probably not want to put a very delicate, mild spirit into a really big, robust, say, you know, red wine cask. That red wine is potentially going to absolutely dominate the flavors of that spirit, and vice versa. If you put a really bold, big, strong spirit into a very mild, say, I don't know, white wine cask um, for a very short amount of time, that cask maybe won't have as much influence on that whiskey as you would like. I can't imagine putting an Ardbeg into a Sauvignon Blanc cask for a week is gonna do anything for that whiskey, but I could be wrong. So with all that being said, how can you have a favorite cask if it's such a gamble? Well, what I'm talking about in this video is cask finishes that I've found to produce a kind of fairly predictable, consistent result. And a lot of the time, when you get to know certain whiskies, you can kind of try a particular spirit and you'll kind of, oh, I wonder, I wonder what that would taste like in that cask. Because again, over time, you start to learn what that cask does to spirits that you know. So you know what the cask does, you know the spirit's flavor profile, and you can start to make these dream matchups in your head. We can take rum casks, for example. Rum casks quite often impart a banana-y, fruity, sometimes sugarcane 
flavour into a whiskey. Uh, you'll probably often hear the term sherry bomb. Now, a lot of the time that we're talking about the big Christmas cake raisins, fruits like uh, raisins and sultanas, maybe even forest fruits. So while you are going to get differences from different spirits and different casks, generally we can assume that a whiskey that is heavily sherried is going to have those Christmas cakey, raisiny notes present. I do plan on doing a much deeper dive into the specifics of different casks. Maybe even do a, you know, try the sherry and then try the whiskey that's been aged in that sherry cask to see if we can spot the differences, but also see the similarities between them. So if that's something you're interested in, do consider getting subscribed. But anyway, let's start talking about some casks. So my first cask, which I'm loving at the moment, is Manthania. Now, I will preface this, I'm not very good at pronouncing words which are not English, so I'm going to do my best. If I get it wrong, let me know down in the comments below how it should be pronounced. Manthania is a Fino style sherry, so it's generally very light but very dry. Quite a lot of people that say it's got a, a very soft mouthfeel, and it is made in the region Andalusia, which I believe is in the southern part of Spain. It is a protected designation of origin, I think is the term. But it basically means that it is protected, it is quality controlled from that area. It cannot be made anywhere else. And it, it is considered a rarity and specific to the microclimate that exists in that particular region of Spain. So what I love about this particular cask, what it does to whiskey, is the salty mustiness that it brings. I, I've never actually tried the sherry itself, but apparently it's, like I say, it's very soft, it's very dry. Now, it brings all of that to a whiskey. To my palate, it's that salty, dry, almost fizzy tanginess that it brings. Two fantastic examples of that. The Glen Murray Warehouse One Manthania. This is absolutely stunning. It's that fizzy, salty thing that I really, really get from this. Glen Murray's got a very nice, light, gentle spirit. Lends itself really, really well to fun and interesting cask finishes. Kind of acts as a bit of a blank canvas, as it were. And it really, really takes on the manthania in this fantastically well. Or like I say, it's that dry, fizzy saltiness. Someone's described as salty sherbet, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Absolutely fantastic. So much so, that's what I'm drinking. This, but I haven't now. This is a nightmare to get hold of. I did try some in the distillery. Also, look at the whiskies I'm showing you here. These are not, oh, I highly recommend you go out and get this. These are just really good examples to me of why I absolutely love that particular cask. So this is the 2004 Manthania finish. This is uh, one of their warehouse exclusives. Their, wa um, their maturation warehouse hand-filled exclusives. This is one of the best whiskies that I've tried in Isla. Now, Buna Haven's got a much bolder, richer, uh, bigger spirit compared to Glen Murray. So I would assume that they've had to leave this in that cask a little bit longer. But it's specifically that mustiness, the, the saltiness really stands up well against the this, this slightly savoury note that you get from a lot of the Buna Haven spirit. It's not that these two whiskies are not massively different, but you can really tell how well those casks have married with that spirit in two completely different ways. So the second cask on this list is White Port. A lot of people know Port. It's a Portuguese fortified wine. Port does come in a handful of different varieties. Uh, most of them made from red grapes, but it is a white port that's specifically made from white grapes. I am a big fan of port finishes in general, but specifically the white port hits a little bit different. Port generally imparts a bit of a tannic, deeper, richer flavour, but the white port a lot brighter. You've got notes of apple, cream, custard, vanilla, and usually on the tail end of that, you've just got a slight nuttiness. Two fantastic examples of this are this particular independent bottling of a Ben Nevis. It's eight years old and it is finished in a first fill white port pipe. This absolutely screams of birthday cake. All I get from this, on the nose, 
yeah, the nose on this is like it's like drinking birthday cake. It's that vanilla, it's cakiness, it's buttercream. It is stunning. Uh, the Ben Nevis Spirit. Um, I've only got two bottles, this and another one, and they've both got quite a, a heavy, like oily, uh, chewy spirit. And it works so so well with that like big heavy spirit and that light vanilla buttercreaminess. It makes for a very, very rich, rich dram. Conversely, we have the Glen Caddam 15. Now again, this has got some of those, some of those vanilla birthday, coat, uh, birthday cake notes coming through. But I think it's because this, I mean, this has spent nearly twice as long in a barrel as the eight year old. This brings a lot more of the apple notes. Think like apple turnover. You get loads of those pastry notes coming through, maybe a bit of custard and that nuttiness really comes through here where this brings a lot of those like birthday cake sponge notes on the front end. This is like a summer whiskey to me. This is a much, much lighter, easy drinking dram than you get. I, I will say uh, these are all cask strength apart from this. This uh, this Glencadden 15 is bottled at 46%. And lastly, one of my all time favourites actually, and this kind of snuck up on me because I was not expecting this to be quite, or for me to be as much of a fan as this as I end up being is Virgin Oak. Think of this as a bourbon barrel that's never had any bourbon in it. As I said earlier on in the episode, uh, bourbon has to be aged in virgin oak. Now, when you make a barrel, you uh, you toast and you char the inside of the barrel. Hang on a sec, I've actually got a stave and I can show you this. So yeah, this is a stave from a barrel. Um, I believe this barrel had been toasted and recharred, but you can see on the inside there, the scale of the char. Now, wood is mostly made of sugar. And when you toast and you char the inside of the barrel, a lot of that sugar caramelizes, just like regular sugar would when you make a caramel. What this does, it means that all of the whiskey that comes into contact with that dissolves those caramelized sugars. You generally get, get fantastic color. Flavor-wise, think peanuts, caramel, popcorn, bubblegum. Similar notes to what you would expect to find in a bourbon. A fantastic example of this really made me fall in love with the Virgin Oak flavor profile is this Edradour 10-year-old virgin oak. This was fully matured in a virgin oak cask. The color is absolutely incredible. And on the palate, it literally is like drinking peanut butter. Caramel peanut butter. All of the caramel notes, the vanilla, they all they all come through. It is, I mean, again, so that's another cask strength whiskey, but it is just so flavorsome. It's so big and it's so rich, but it's not sickly at any point. I've really, really fallen in love with Virgin Oak, almost for its simplicity of flavors. It's such a basic kind of flavor profile. A lot of the time as well, notes that you're gonna find from an ex-bourbon cask, anyway, or even just from the, the malt whiskey itself, you're gonna get some nice cereal notes. Marry themselves so fantastically well. Now, obviously, some of these whiskeys are likely to be quite hard to get hold of. None of them are particularly expensive, actually. You have the, the Glen Caddam is fairly easy to get hold of. I think the Edradour 10 year old is, is fairly um, fairly accessible as well. But this isn't about the bottles of whiskey specifically. This is about the casks that they've been in. The reason I've chosen these whiskies is because these are profiles that I find that are very common to that particular cask finish. If any of these kind of palettes sound exciting to you, go out, try and find a bottle of whiskey that has been finished in the same cask type, because I would bet that you're probably gonna find a lot of the same flavors. But anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you all very much for watching. If you've liked this video, please do drop a like down below. And if you'd like to support the channel, please do consider subscribing. Let me know down in the comments if you've tried any of these whiskies, or if you've got a particular cask finish that you really gravitate towards, something that you really, really like. And on that note, Slanchevar.